speeds and capabilities humans can only dream of replicating organically. But can it always be trusted to provide us with unbiased, objective information? Well, let's just say it's complicated. Or let's say that basically I don't know. Here is somebody who actually does know. Please welcome to the stage the co-founder and CDO of Sumo Logic, Christian Bittchen. Summit. It's good to be back, my third time. I love this conference. I love this city. I love the people. Hope you had fun. Emil's a great speaker. We actually are using his software. So I guess I have to talk to him a little bit afterwards. Uh, very good. So, my name is Christian. I started a company called Sumo Logic in 2010. At Sumo Logic, we are using machine data to help our customers monitor, troubleshoot, and ultimately secure the critical applications that drive their businesses. So we are clearly a data company. In fact, we are a machine data company. We're using lots of machine data, but our focus is on empowering humans to make better decisions. Enough about me. This is Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, who walked into a privacy conference two weeks ago and started talking about the data industrial complex. He was attacking the use of data in the light of privacy. Data brokers, and even though he didn't name them, companies like Google and Facebook. And I was shocked. Data industrial complex that is, a, that is a strong term. It's obviously a play on military industrial complex. And military industrial complex is also a very loaded term. I grew up in, the, uh, in Germany in the 80s, and I heard that term first through the actions of the German terror group, Red Army Faction, who used association with the military industrial complex as an excuse to assassinate people. So that's pretty rough. And here we have the CEO of, uh, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, the company with the largest market cap of the world, you know, using this kind of language. So you could argue that there are certain commercial interests at play here. Apple is competing with Google and Facebook. Google and Facebook are using information they clean from, from users browsing and using their apps to sell it to advertisers, as everybody knows. Apple doesn't do that. They sell very high-priced hardware. But what struck me even more in the tone and in the use of language here is the shift that is apparently happening in the discussion. Before, the discussion was about what can we achieve, what cool things can we achieve with big data, machine learning, and so forth, lots of hype around it. And now this guy shows up and basically starts making an ethics argument. You should not abuse the data that you collect on your users. So of course, over the last year in particular, privacy related to data has become a much bigger topic. Uh, I guess we can thank Facebook for this. At the same time, societies have also started to wisen up and uh, you know, there are laws, especially in Europe, as you guys I'm sure are well aware of, like GDPR, that are, that are trying you know, to regulate some of these sort of most egregious misuse of data. So I think that's good. We will see whether GDPR is being enforced with enough T's to really change the behavior uh, of companies. But I can tell you that even in the US, this is a big topic for us. Uh, and uh, you know, in California, we're probably going to get a similar regulation at some point soon. But I guess we're not quite over the hump yet. As I'm browsing the internet, I'm coming across this thing, an internet connected thermometer. So this thing collects the temperature data and sends it to the cloud. And then, of course, the company goes and sells this data, apparently in aggregate. That's what they say. 
and they sell it to people like Clorox advertisers who then direct their advertising spend into areas where the temperatures are rising. So in Silicon Valley, my friends say that this is the next big thing. The internet of things in my ass. And so I guess, all kidding aside, you know, we are still to some degree living in a world that is very much excited about the use of data, big data, and so forth. So we see a lot of things that we probably would rather not like to see, especially when it comes to privacy, I already said. But you know, I don't want to be I don't want to be too negative on it. There are good users of big data. There's good users of machine learning. A lot of it happens in the medical space. So this is an example I came across recently. The topic here is uh, detecting different kinds of lung cancer using image recognition. And the system can, in this case, make much better qualitative decisions on a specific type of cancer that is very hard to tell apart uh, you know, for human experts, uh, which then leads to the right treatment sooner and can ultimately save or improve or in other, ways, in other, in, in other ways positively impact the, uh, the health of the patient. And this is obviously a very serious topic. And I think that stuff is good. Let's do more of this. And then, you know, we have problematic aspects of the use of data. I don't want to go into this in too much detail. If you want to read up on it, here are three books that are unfortunately awesome. Uh, I, you know, I, I know from previous talks that you know, folks always like to take references. Uh, if you don't manage to snap the picture here, just hit me up on the Web uh, Summit app afterwards, and I'll, I'll send you the links. The underlying theme in all of these books that's coming through is that there are, that there are systemic issues that arise when humans use data to justify decisions about other humans. And that's very sad because the data is used here, for example, in welfare administration, in uh, you know, school admission and you know, other things along those lines, prism or you know, prisoner recidivism and so forth, all pretty heavy duty topics. Data analysis and models are being created in order to take away the subjectivity that's being ascribed to human decision making. And what people who have looked into the topic found, and that's what we find in these books, is that that actually makes things worse because the idea that the model that's being, that's being used to automate these types of decisions is actually objective will then also lead to the fact that if you're an individual that's on the other side of such a decision, a decision that's being made on you, for example, welfare denied, it's going to be very hard for you to appeal to this because A, nobody knows why the algorithm says what it says, and B, because it's supposedly objective. And the reality is, when you look at it, you'll find that the biases and conceptions of the people who create the models and who collect the data ultimately are being borne out in the results of the algorithm itself. So it is just as subjective, except for now it sounds objective and it's much harder for you to do something about it. And not to be a party pooper, but I guess I have to, not all users of technology, you know, of data, of analytics, of machine learning are necessarily good in the medical space. Uh, commercial interests sometimes prevail, as we've seen in this uh, recent example from IBM. This is again about um, using systems to identify cancer. And when you dig in, you find that it was actually trained on a very small sample and the samples were synthesized, but it was sold and it was used and uh, it, it's a big problem. So what we're seeing often is that contrary to this idea that by using data to get objectivity, all we get is the biases and the subjectivity of those who do the analysis reinforced. So it's in many ways, when you look in the mirror, all you see is yourself. And it doesn't look like by using data and analyzing data, we have necessarily solved the problem of subjectivity. But I also think, even though there are negative examples that can be quoted until the cows come home, I also think that most people, and I'm pretty sure it's true for everybody in this audience, 
who has to do something with data or who does something with data, you guys don't have malicious intent. You are doing this because you generally think that by doing the practices that you've learned, you can come up with better decisions. So fundamentally, I think, as humans, we do have this desire to figure out what is true. But what we've seen recently is that it then often leads to statements like this. It's my, two of my least favorite statements. The idea that data grants objectivity is simply an illusion. So let's see if that works for your eyes on the big screen here. It is, in fact, an illusion. Why is it an illusion? Because I say data is fundamentally human. Data is generated, observed, analyzed, and fundamentally, ultimately interpreted by humans. So you could say, well, but I'm just observing facts. Well, but how do you observe the facts? What instruments are you using? Who made those instruments? What are you actually observing? What choices are you making and what do you observe? What methods of analysis do you use? How do you, how do you ultimately interpret the results of what you've gotten? Every single step involves a large amount of human decision making. Subjective human decision making. And it's a fallacy to think, in my personal opinion, that by falling back on data analysis, the results of your experiments, the results of your research, can be called objective. And this happens to the best of us. In the 50s, at some point, people realized that there might be, there's got to be, a reason for the increasing number of lung cancer patients. So there we go, more cancer. And there was, a, there was a big debate because nobody knew how to prove it. There was suspicion that the rise of smoking had something to do with it. But you can't do random controlled trials. You can't force 3,000 people to smoke if they don't want to, especially not if you actually think that it might kill them. That's not a particularly ethic, ethical way of going about things. So what they did is they resolved to, uh, you know, secondary observations. And there was more and more correlation showing. This guy, this dude here, R.A. Fisher, generally known or, or probably most of you have heard of him, understood as like one of the fathers of, fathers of modern statistics. This guy argued very, very hard that there is in fact no causation between smoking and lung cancer, even though all of the you know, statistical analysis that had been done started pointing to the probability, and this was in the 50s, that this is true. Fisher said there are confounding factors at play here. This is the preeminent statistician at the time. Very smart dude. He was freaking wrong. Happens to the best of us. Another thing I find interesting, this is from the um, Structure of Scientific Revolutions by Thomas Kuhn. It's a, it's a classic book. Planck and Einstein figured out that light is photons before people were thinking about it in terms of wave theory. And then even before that, this guy Newton said, light is material, corpus, I can't even pronounce that, corpus cools. Who, what the heck is this? Why am I bringing up this example? At any given point in history, there was a prevailing paradigm that was used to explain things. And that is what people thought of as the truth. Who knows, one of you might come up next week and have a better theory than what Blank and Einstein created. And you're going to shift the paradigm. And then we will think of what was before as being untrue. But is it untrue? Is it not just a function of what was true at the time? Are those people quoted here that had previous theories, are they wrong? Are they not smart? I don't think so. 
So this gets very tricky. If you want to know more, here's a couple more books on you know, the dangers <laughs> of thinking uh, that there's anything along the lines of you know, objectivity or real truth that can come out of, um, of science. So the struggle is real because we want to do well. As I said, I don't think that we have malicious intent. And I do not want to come across and tell you that you shouldn't use data to inform your decisions. In fact, I think you absolutely should. Join the resistance, figure out new stuff, use data, use your instincts, use your intuition, and challenge the prevailing paradigm. But you've got to be aware of the consequences that your actions can potentially have when the results of your analysis, when your models are informing decisions that are affecting actual humans on the other side. That's what I want to caution you about. So ultimately, what we're talking here is ethics. So now ethics is a huge topic, and I can certainly not summarize it in one minute. There is a sub-branch of ethics. It's actually not that complicated, called normative ethics, where you know, people have thought through for a long time what are moral standards that we can apply to figure out whether our actions are right or wrong? And so again, this is a deep field and there's lots of philosophical discussion and so forth. But as I was researching this, the thing that sort of resonated to me and that kind of fits with the theme of the talk, I think, is my, is my homeboy, Immanuel Kant. He of the uh, categorical imperative, and you know, one formulation of the categorical, uh, um, uh, categorical imperative says, treat people as an end and never as a means to an end. And I think that's definitely worth keeping in mind. Oftentimes we justify the means with the end. If there's humans in the picture, the humans always have to be the end. That's what I personally believe. I think that's a good starting point. And there's other things that, uh, that you can kind of do if you kind of look into this a little bit more. Uh, in, in, in terms of uh, uh, you know, what people have sort of thought about in the last you know, many hundred years on what can help you in making those decisions. But I think this one is a good starting point. On the more applied side, obviously what I'm talking about is not something that I just you know, came up with five minutes ago. This is a topic that's being widely discussed. And ethics in computing, ethics in you know, data science, ethics in data analysis and so forth, are a topic that people have talked about before. On the applied side, from a practical perspective, the, associ the Association of Computing Machinery has, uh, I think, a fairly, fairly solid list of guidelines that you can look up. And I like this one also very much. Um, that was uh, published in, uh, in, a, in a paper, in a peer-reviewed peer paper in the Public Library of Science. Uh, 10 simple rules for responsible big data research. And see there again, the very first point Data are people and can do harm. And that's probably the one and one only thing I want you to remember from this talk. It's, I call this the Pikachu framework of data analytics. Data is generated by humans. Data is ultimately analyzed by humans. And the results of the analytics are being applied to humans again. And sometimes you are the people that are analyzing the data. And sometimes, and more often so than not, you will be on the receiving end of somebody else's analytics. So keep that in mind, thank you.